Welcome everyone. This is the Mission San Juan Capistrano Virtual Earth Day live stream tour of the Mission's West Gardens. My name is Jessica Crossman. I'm the Education Director here at the Mission. And I'm so excited you can join us for the first Virtual Earth Day event of our whole month long celebration. I'm joined this morning by two of our wonderful Gardening Angel volunteers both Tony Nelson and Jan Sorensen. They're gonna be helping us tour around the West Garden this morning. And it's just starting to rain, what are the chances? We're gonna go ahead and get started with Tony showing us around the vegetable and herb gardens. Good morning, Tony. Good morning, Jessica. Welcome to our garden. And I'm kind of grateful for the rain. It's not great for this performance, but we need it. And uh, never rains in California, but we need it today. I'm going to start by talking to you about our grapevine. This big granddaddy of a grapevine, I don't know if you can zoom in on him. It's this giant vine, but it fills the entire arbor and gives us a really nice respite in the summer when we need some, some uh, shade for our crops and also for our volunteers. So we're very grateful for that. And we know that grapes were grown here because just up here, is a uh, wine vat where they used to crush the grapes and make wine for Eucharistic purposes and probably use the grapes to eat as well. But by the fall, we will have, this whole arbor will be dripping with vines. And we'll have beautiful grapes hanging underneath, which we share with the kids. So I'll show you, first of all, our artichokes over here. This guy is ready to pick today. They're beautiful plants. And just to show you how each plant is, Kind of unique and different just like people. These were all planted at the same time. And this little guy is just getting started. I don't know if you can zoom in. He has one little tiny artichoke here. So they're all the same plant, but they all have different sizes just like people do. And here's our strawberry plot. Uh, we get several seasons of strawberries here. We probably get three or four crops. They kind of die out in the summer. It gets a little too warm for them. But most of the year we get strawberries. Let me, let me join you. Here's one I can pluck for you right here. You can zoom in on him. Ooh, They're beautiful. smaller than the ones we're getting in the grocery store, but they taste so sweet. They're wonderful. That's They're wonderful. Lovely. And I want to show you our uh, volunteers over here, our favorite plant in the mission. These are hollyhocks. And they've been here forever. I think if you go to the soldiers' barracks, you'll see paintings of, um, I think, Mary Pickford's wedding, which includes hollyhocks. I think they've been here at the mission for years and years, and they're volunteers. They end up all over the mission, and we just let them grow wherever they show up. You can see over here, they're even in our blacksmith area. With, all the, with terrible soil, no water, but they still grow. They're amazing. Can you zoom in on the blossom? Yeah. They come in all different colors and we just love them. They're beautiful, beautiful plants. Okay, I'll show you what our next spot. Our vegetables. Okay, right behind you. Here's our vegetables. Our vegetables. We have some repairs going on behind me to our sprinkler. So thank you, Sam. <laughs> And here's a few things I just uh, picked out this morning. So this is one of our leeks and they get huge. Wow. And our onions get even bigger, as you can see, they're ginormous. And uh, here's a Brussels sprout from our Brussels sprouts that are just finishing their season over here. So they're part of our winter garden. And we're in a transition period between winter crops and summer crops. So in the winter, we grow all the cruciferous things like cabbage, cauliflower, Brussels sprouts, uh, broccoli, kales, and lettuces all come in the winter in California. And then in the summer, we start planting um, our peppers. We just planted peppers right here. Let me take a look. These are just coming up. So you can see we're in transition. So these are cabbages just forming their heads and ready to be harvested. We've got some mixed greens still left. That's mustard plant in there. And then the peppers are coming up and we'll start blooming in another couple of months, another month or so. The cauliflower, as I said, is coming to the end. We have two different varieties of cauliflower here. We have some that form a very tight head and some that form these really cool little, um, 
little pieces that you can stir fry and they're wonderful. Mm, wow. You can see how they form right here. That's cool. This is a pot ready for new plants. We'll probably be putting a squash in there next week. And uh, this is some Swiss chard, which will still, still be okay in the garden for another month or so. It'll get very tall and beautiful. Over here is cilantro, also known as uh, coriander, and it gets really big here. And I want to show you this plant. This actually comes, I suppose, with me. Sure. Let me meet you on the other side. <laughs> yeah. Okay, these are fava beans. And right here are the, the flowers that start the plant. So wow. they have these beautiful white flowers. And each of them forms a bean. And the bean starts small and becomes, see how tiny they are? Mm -hmm. And then they become huge. And I'll show you over here where I cut them up to show you how they look. The kids absolutely adore these. So this is what happens when you open them. They have this soft um, sort of felt inside them that the kids love to feel. And then inside is this wonderful plant, wonderful bean that becomes a fava bean. And you can peel off this bitter membrane and eat it just like edamame. They're wow. wonderful. Here's one of our lettuces that we just uh, harvested this morning. This is a romaine. Oh, beautiful. Romaine. Somebody is asking if we have any carrots. Uh, yes, actually we do. I'll show you carrots. We kale here. More cabbages. Here's our tomatoes, which are our summer crop. They'll be coming up soon. Wow. And here are chives. These chive plants are probably five years old. They, we, they just uh, bloom and they get these beautiful little blossoms, these which are, are edible as well. Gorgeous flowers. And then we yeah. cut them off. And they just come up again. So we, we've had, these are at least five years old. That's amazing. Here's some smaller lettuces that are growing and our ginormous onions. They actually flower and make a beautiful flower. So we let them do that just to show people what they look like. How cool. Here's more peppers. We're planting all different colors, yellows, reds, greens. We'll, we'll also plant some of the hot peppers later, like the serranos and poblanos. And then here's our carrots. They oh. are just about harvesting themselves. So they will come up next week. Oh, I can actually see a little bit of orange right yeah, there. Yeah, there they are. Yeah. And here's some cabbages that are ready to harvest almost today. They're beautiful. I love how they come up. Beautiful colors. And these that look like skinny onions are not onions at all. These are garlic. Oh, wow. And we plant those by buying the bulb. And we break up the bulb into pieces and just plant it in rows and we get garlic. Oh, how cool. So we'll be ready for salsa soon. <laughs> so come over here. Sure. Another one of our uh, vegetable garden. And this one also is in transition. We have several kinds of kale here. Whoops. You okay? Yes. Several kinds of kale here. This is dinosaur kale. Oh, I and love dinosaur kale. for those little bumpy, bumpy things, just like a dinosaur would have. Yeah. And here's our regular kale, which just is a really hardy plant. We, we grow this all the time. Yeah. Our, uh, some of our lettuces, our romains are coming right to the end. And we have mint, of course. A tip to gardeners, don't ever plant mint in the ground. It will take over your entire garden, <laughs> but you can plant it in a in a pot and it's just fine. And here's our transition on our, our ancient um, trellis. We have um, pole beans are coming in right now. We just planted them. And all summer they will climb and climb and we'll have beans all summer. Oh wow. And they will also go in on this side to replace these peas that are kind of ugly right now because they are at the end, mm. they're over. Here's our fava beans again. And uh, just the very late broccoli. Oh, yeah. We've got some beets. Ooh, look at those beautiful red. Really nice beets. beets. And we have eggplant, celery. We try to plant a variety so we can show families and kids mm -hmm. just what the crops look like when they grow. Absolutely. And I'll take you over to our herb garden. Please do. 
Let me try to see if there's any other questions. Some of the questions you've already answered. Somebody asked, do we have any blueberries growing here? No, blueberries uh, need a colder climate, I believe. Yeah. So they're not really, um, they're not really suitable for California, but strawberries, yes. You can see some of our, <laughs> our uh, fencing is very, very empty. Does the job. Yes. This is our herb garden and it's dominated by this beautiful cross, which is a privet head. You can see another one of these hollyhocks. Look at that giant thing. Oh, it's huge. That's growing into a California pepper tree. You can see the red berries on it. Mm -hmm. It actually forms a pepper. It's a beautiful canopy. It gives us lot, lots of shade. Yeah, that's wonderful. This is a uh, common sage, which has a culinary use. Obviously, we use it in, you know, stuffings and mm -hmm. all kinds of uh, Good dishes. Good chicken, right? Yes, but it has the longest list of medicinal uses. Everything. Oh, that's all kinds neat. Of digestive, colds, uh, depression, everything. This one is called Feverfew, and it is really good for migrainers. Oh, wow. Yeah, it's also good for depression, for headaches. I don't think I've heard of that one before. This guy is Winter Savory, which uh, has a really nice taste. You can use it in stuffings or breadings or with chicken and poultry and so on. Yeah. But it also is good for beef steak. Oh, wow. There are a few samples here I cut for you this morning. This is lavender. Everyone oh, knows what this beautiful. is. beautiful. And the families just love smelling this when they come through. It's a wonderful thing to put in a guest room or yeah. you can make sachets or oils to uh, use in your home for fragrance. Mm -hmm. This is rosemary, which we have a lovely plant over here. Mm -hmm. And here's one that looks a lot like uh, lavender, but it isn't. This is Italian basil. Really delicious. Wow. Beautiful but it flowers. has a beautiful flower. I mm. love this one. Here is pineapple sage. It's too bad about our masks because it has a distinct pineapple uh, smell to it. Uh -huh. And it gets a red flower. We have a lot of salvias and sages here. This is lemon balm. And again, the fever few and the sage. Ooh, you know what? I can smell can some smell of, yeah, I think I'm smelling the sage. It smells beautiful. And I'd also like to show you this. This is one of my favorites. This is curry, which has the most exquisite scent. It's, it's really mild and soft. It's, it's a beautiful smell. It doesn't smell anything like what you'd call Indian curry, yeah. which is really a mixture of all kinds of plants, turmeric and all sorts of things. But this is the actual curry plant and it has medicinal uses as well. And it's um, just a beautiful plant. Well, that's great. You can kind of see what's going on here. Back in the corner, we have borage which is good for arthritis. You can make a tea out of it. It has anti-inflammatory uh, qualities and it has a really neat uh, white flower. It's often called um, star flower. Oh, wow, that's great. And we're growing fennel here in the back, which is uh, very attractive for um, swallowtail butterflies. We have a lot of monarchs here at the mission. I know you're gonna be talking about that. Yeah. The swallowtails love it here too. Oh, that's wonderful. Let me turn around this way. There's a little tour for you. Well, uh, there's a couple of questions. So somebody okay. was asking whether or not this mission is the first mission where grapes were grown. And I, to the best of my knowledge, that, that does seem like uh, a possibility based on historic record. Um, I don't know if you know anything. I don't, I don't really know anything about that. I do know that because we found the, the vats in the ruins, I would suspect that grape production was a big deal here. Yes, absolutely. And remember that we, this is just four plots that we have for display. Uh, when the mission was actually operating as a mission, there would have been acres and acres yeah. of uh, crops. And um, actually one of the historians gave me a list of all of their production one year. <laughs> And it was huge, like 15,000 bushels of wheat and barley and corn, all sorts of things they used to grow. Here. That's amazing. Thank you for sharing. Well, we do have some more questions, but I'm going to try to save some of those for okay. the end because I want to talk um, to another one of our volunteers here. Let me turn my camera around. So we're going to talk now to another volunteer, uh, gardening volunteer named Jan Sorensen, who's going to talk to us um about the native plants that were planted here um before we talk to jan i just want to say thank you tony you're very welcome <laughs> okay so jan is right over here 
And um, I'm going to let her take over and talk to you about some of the really beautiful native plants that we have planted here that are special. So here is Jan. Hi, Jan. Um, hi, how are you today? I'm doing well. What, what do you have to show well, us? This is a new garden planted specifically to attract butterflies. These are native plants for the most part. And um, as I said, they are here planted specifically to attract butterflies. Um, native plants are plants that are found growing in areas that nobody planted. And you'll find them in any plant in any area that just has lived there for years and years and years. They just occur naturally. They just occur naturally. Yeah. Nobody planted them. Yeah. So I planted these. <laughs> <laughs> but in the, in the wild, in these, the wild, these plants would have been found just naturally in the area. Now we could go into the area and we would find these plants growing. Yeah. Even now. Um, and that means they're very important for the ecosystem and the, the, the animals here. They are, yeah. Everything here. And the Native Americans, yeah. they use these plants for a lot of things, especially medicinally. Yes. They really got a lot out of these. And I don't, you know, I'm thinking the Native Americans were here forever and they just passed down. Yes. How did they first? No, to take some matia hot poppy. Yeah. And make yeah. a drink from this. Yeah. And to cure whatever. It's amazing. It's, it. Yeah, it's that way throughout all human history, right. isn't it? That's and incredible. They, so they take these and they they um boil them. And what's the name of this one again? This is Matia Poppy. Beautiful. And you can see here the uh, bud of the flower, yeah. which is going to be this big. Yeah. And a lot of people call this the fried eggplant uh -huh. because the center of that is a bright yellow center with the white, white, and it looks exactly like a fried egg. Oh, beautiful. And they're beautiful and they get big. This one, has not reached its full height yet. It'll probably be about eight feet, I would say. Uh -huh. And they spread. I, they just keep going. Yeah. They just keep going. Yeah. And um, the natives use this for food, the seeds. They would grind up seeds. Um, you can see over here on this salvia, a sage. This is a black sage. Oh, beautiful. Let me get, get in And there. I wish you were here to smell this because it has a most wonderful fragrance. Wow. And this black sage you see here are the, are the seed pods. So the seeds will be in here uh -huh. and when it dries. And here's the flowers. And then the flowers make the, the seed pods. Mm -hmm. The Native Americans would grind down the seeds they you know breads and things like that teas from the leaves um cured all kinds of things headaches aches and pains and yeah stomach aches and you name it they cured everything the grasses are very important to the native americans because they made baskets from these uh -huh. and um and what kind of grass is this? This is a deer grass. Deer grass. This is a deer grass. I'm getting close here. Wow. And it's a pretty, I think it's pretty to see. Isn't that nice the way the, and the seeds are along here. Mm -hmm. And they, of course, just like flour, you know, you can grind up things and make a flour from the ground up seeds. Yeah, and they the there's oh, so many baskets. So many made baskets. out of this. Yeah. This is a this is a plant. This is another sage, salvia. And Ooh, this wow. is a plant that um, the Native Americans consider sacred. Mm -hmm. And it has a fragrance that is unbelievably strong. Some people 
don't like it at all. I think it's really good. And these white flowers and the are white beautiful. Flowers, and if you feel it, it's kind of sticky. Oh. It's soft and sticky. That's wonderful. And it has a, a lot of um, oils in it. It just makes the, the fragrance uh, through my mask. It's yeah, I can, smell, I can smell it too. Yeah, it's yeah. beautiful. And what they would do is they would cut off pieces of this plant down here. So you can cut this off. Yeah. About, oh, 10 inches. Bundle them together. Mm -hmm. And they'd make a smudge bundle out of these. Yeah. What they did with these, they dry them. And then in their ceremonies yeah they were very important they would light them and they this plant being so full of resin burns but smolders it doesn't start a flame or, and the smoke pours out yeah that's wonderful thank yeah. you for sharing that yeah. jan there are a few questions let me just see so somebody was asking if the word fragrance means smell and it does and yes it, does. it absolutely right. does um, and then somebody was asking, um, what do you think we grow the most here as far as plants at the mission? What do we grow the most of? Well, we do try to grow native plants. If not native plants that don't need a lot of water. Mm. That is what we try to concentrate on here. Yeah. Um, because of course we should conserve water. We should be aware of that. Yeah. And we are. One of the things that the mission has always had, I think, are roses. Uh huh. And we do have a lot of roses. Yeah. And people enjoy them. Um, and they really enjoy the native plants, too, I think. They're yeah, very I think, interesting. I think so, too. They're beautiful. Yeah. yeah. Well, thank you so much for sharing this, Jan. We have one more part of the West Gardens that we are going to go uh, talk about today. So thank you, Jan. You're welcome. Bye-bye. <laughs> Stick around just in case there's more questions. So we're going to talk about one last place here in the West Gardens at the Mission, and that is our special monarch butterfly habitat that I'm standing in front of. But let me uh, switch my camera around so I can show you it in all of its glory. So this monarch butterfly habitat is something that we started uh, installing here at the mission just a couple years ago. And what it does is it's not designed to um, keep butterflies inside of here. We're not keeping butterflies captive. What we are actually doing with this monarch butterfly habitat is we are finding monarch butterfly eggs that have been laid in milkweed plants out here in the mission. And milkweed is the only plant where monarch butterflies will lay their eggs. We find those monarch butterfly eggs um, on plants here at the mission. And we take those plants with the eggs in them and we place them inside so that the eggs and then the caterpillars that come out of them are protected. And that's important because the monarch butterfly population, sadly, over the past few years has been declining. So what we're doing is we're protecting wild monarch butterfly eggs and caterpillars while they grow inside of the butterfly habitat here. And then after their chrysalis is formed and they then emerge from their chrysalis, then we release the monarch butterflies back out into nature where they belong. I wanna show you the development, the life cycle of a monarch butterfly because that's kind of important to learn about um, when we're talking about the butterflies themselves. So here I have different images that show you the monarch butterfly life cycle. So first the monarch butterfly will lay the egg on a milkweed plant. That's what the egg looks like. It's super teeny tiny, almost like a grain of rice. After um, the egg <laughs> has been hatched out of, here's what the little larva looks like. And this larva, grows, eats the milkweed plant, and becomes a caterpillar. And caterpillars are very hungry. You know that book, Very Hungry Caterpillar. It's very true. So they eat those milkweed plants. And then um, when the time comes, so it's about two weeks 
then they form into this J shape and eventually they cover themselves um, and become enclosed in this chrysalis. So they're in their chrysalis for about eight to 10 days. And when their chrysalis becomes clear like this, then you can see that it's time for them to emerge as a beautiful butterfly. So it's a very, very kind of cool process. Butterfly, monarch butterfly egg to, to actual butterfly. And it's a process that we're very happy to help protect here at the mission. I wanna go inside and show you a few of the caterpillars that we have right now inside of the habitat, because I think it's kind of cool to see in action. So let me go ahead and uh, enter into our butterfly habitat. Let me flip my camera here. So we have milkweed plant here. Like I said, this is the only plant where monarch butterflies will lay their eggs. And you can see we have some caterpillars. Here's a teeny tiny little one right there. Let's see if you can focus. There you go. We also have some bigger caterpillars like this guy. Let me see if I can get a better look at him for you. There he is. So we have these caterpillars here, just enjoying their milkweed being protected. And eventually they will climb up to a spot in the habitat and form that J shape so they can make their chrysalis. There's another one right there for you. Now the milkweed that we have here, um, we do have some native milkweed, but some of it's tropical. And really it's ideal if we're able to have native milkweed. Remember, um, like we talked when we talked to Jan earlier, native plants are plants that just naturally appear, uh, grow in this area. So ideally we would have as much native milkweed as possible. Um, but there's also something called tropical milkweed that's sold quite often at nurseries here. Um, and this is an example of one. You can see the, the brightly colored flowers. The only thing is with tropical milkweed, it kind of, it blossoms all year long. So we have to make sure to cut it back um, after the monarch butterfly season is over to make sure that the the tropical milkweed doesn't carry any diseases or funguses um, because that can happen if it's allowed to bloom all year. And we actually have a special video um, in our Earth Day collection on our website from a, a monarch conservation specialist named Susie Vanderlip, who we work with quite often. And uh, she shows you in that video how to cut down tropical milkweed to make sure that it's, it's gonna be healthy for the next season. And in that entire video, she actually talks to you about how to make an entire uh, garden that's monarch butterfly friendly. So I hope you enjoy seeing that as well. I'm gonna check to see if there are any questions right now. Um, I do wanna say that we are very grateful to our volunteer, Joe McAllister, who made the monarch butterfly habitat possible here at the mission. She worked really hard to um, make sure that the monarch butterfly habitat is as beautiful and has as many uh, milkweed plants with happy caterpillars on it. Let's see. So we don't have any chrysalises currently um, to answer the question that I see in the Q&A. We don't have any chrysalises currently in the monarch butterfly habitat, but hopefully fingers crossed we will soon. So how long does it take a caterpillar to turn into a monarch butterfly. So I believe the whole process takes a, a, a few weeks. Um, I don't know the exact number of days off the top of my head. That is a wonderful question. So we do have butterflies now here at the mission. Just in general, there's a lot of uh, monarch butterflies that are very happy in our gardens. 
because we have a lot of uh, monarch butterfly plants, uh, friendly plants that they like to come and drink the nectar from. So we have a lot of butterflies that are currently flying around here now, but because it's a little cold, um, I don't see a lot flying around right here today. I wish I did, then I would absolutely show you. Well, I'd like to say a big thank you to all of you for joining us today. Thank you to our two volunteers, Jan and Tony, and to Jill who made the Monarch Butterfly Habitat possible, like I said before. We hope that you enjoy the rest of today's Earth Day live streams and all of the special videos that we have on our website in honor of Earth Day, as well as the special scavenger hunt activity. You can go to the website and print that. Thank you so much for joining us today, and we hope that you tune in later. Bye, everybody.